welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, we really have a fantastic turnout. Uh, and I'm going to uh, start with sharing my screen, if all goes well. <laughs> uh, always a trick. Um, can you all see my uh, presentation at this point? Yes. Great, great. Uh, so I uh, have been asked, uh, invited to uh, lead off this course by giving you a bit of my history uh, and how I ended up in the field of global health and some of the, the uh, opportunities uh, that came along my way that I took full advantage of and uh, uh, found a very uh, fruitful and rewarding uh, type of career in global health. And I encourage all of you who might be interested in this field um, to uh, consider uh, looking into it in much more detail uh, throughout this course uh, and as you move into your own uh, further educational initiatives, your career uh, choices along the way. So how did I get started in global health? And I'm going to go back to actually my college years. I, you know, during high school, I was always interested in biology, but it really was in college that I took a course. Um, it was actually a course in what's called parasitology. Um, and uh, I sort of really fell into uh, a, a great deal of excitement about this uh, particular field. You can, parasites are bigger than viruses and bacteria. And so you can see them uh, actually uh, quite easily. They cause a huge burden of global health disease and morbidity uh, throughout the world. But what really made the difference was having my first mentor. Mentors uh, are going to um, be essentially. Um, uh, a resounding uh, call uh, to all of you to seek out a mentor along your way. You may have already done that through your teachers and other educators, but I really believe you should uh, move um, actively uh, in following your, your interests and your pursuits uh, by seeking out a mentor and developing a good relationship. Mine was George Craig. Here's a photograph of him. He has since passed away. Um, but he took a liking to me. He sort of mentored me along uh, those uh, college days. And in fact, I joined him to, uh, I guess you would call it a gap year before I started medical school. Uh, I actually uh, joined his PhD program uh, and, and really just fell in love with the science and, and his enthusiasm about that science. And so um, at the end of, of my time with him, I ended up publishing in the Journal of Heredity. This is my very first publication. I worked on vectors or mosquitoes that spread disease and tried to make them infertile. Uh, this is still a very active uh, area of research, but we're dating myself going back, but it was the first time that anyone had uh, mixed biology with a scanning electron microscope, which had just been really invented. Um, and you can see by changing uh, some of the genes in this uh, a particular vector, um, we actually had uh, a foot growing out of the end of uh, the proboscis and the mosquito was, uh, could not draw blood, could not bite humans. Um, so you could uh, spare yourself all those um, mosquito bites. The problem was that uh, it was a one generation effect. If they can't get blood, they can't reproduce. Um, and so you would have to mass produce this uh, and release into the wild where they would try and compete with endogenous uh, vectors. But in any event, um, I really enjoyed uh, my time working with him. Um, but uh, the call for medicine uh, was out there for me. And so I went off to medical school. I went to Northwestern uh, University School of Medicine uh, and met another medical student there uh, named Michael Dunn uh, and uh, another 
uh, individual was still at Notre Dame where I had done my undergraduate and graduate work. And we uh, went from the vector right to the parasite, malaria. Plasmodium burgii is the organism that infects uh, uh, rats and mice um, and can be used as an animal model for what takes place uh, in humans. And I uh, completed that work um, as well as my medical school. And so uh, I was doing a little bit of research while going through medical school, but then the call once again came out that it was time for me to start taking care of patients. I had finished my four years of medical school, went off uh, to New York where I completed an internship and a residency in internal medicine. But it was at that point while I was doing my residency that I knew I wanted to go into infectious diseases. Here I'd been working in parasitology with parasites things that were causing huge amount of human disease. But I wanted to be able to combine my research with um, my medical uh, practice. And so I applied to the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Uh, and I joined them in 1977. And I continued my work with malaria. Malaria at the time, uh, and to some degrees in some countries is still uh, the leading cause of death in children, uh, in, particularly in low and middle income countries living in the tropical areas. And I wanted to try and see how were they, uh, you know, how this mouse model actually would not die, would get very sick, but then would clear the parasites. And we tried to understand how that happened. And we uncovered that the immune system was very actively involved in the clearance of these infected red blood cells. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm just giving you a taste of my, uh, I guess you would call it the early developmental years. I finished that work and I went out to the University of Washington, I actually set up a refugee clinic um, and act actively saw patients with active malaria, tuberculosis, other diseases coming in mostly from Southeast Asia into the Seattle area. But while I was there, and I was only in Seattle for two years at the University of Washington, I did seek out another mentor. Um, and Kincaid Holmes uh, is now retired at the University of Washington. But I owe him most of my academic career uh, in how to approach um, uh, epidemics and pandemics and uh, going through uh, epidemiologic investigations. Um, he uh, was a professor of medicine at the University of Washington and head of infectious diseases at uh, the Seattle King, Com King County. Um, uh, hospital, and I worked with him for two years. He's also known for um, probably being the leader in, in the biology and immunology of sexually transmitted diseases. And when I first joined his team, he said, Tom, we don't have a lot of malaria sexually transmitted, but we do have an organism that is the leading bacterial sexually transmitted disease in the world and in the United States. And that's chlamydia trachomatis. And interesting, you don't need to go into detail here, but uh, as I started my work on chlamydia, I found it was very analogous uh, really to malaria. Instead of infecting red blood cells like malaria does, the organism shown here uh, they're called EBs or elementary bodies, uh, infect columnar epithelial cells. These line the cervix and the urogenital tract and uh, cause misery for many women um, and uh, men uh, as a sexually transmitted pathogen. And uh, this is its life cycle, just like a malaria life cycle. 
Uh, it takes 48 to 72 hours for full maturation. It destroys the cell that it's in uh, and then starts the life cycle again. I, really quite similar to malaria. So I, I didn't totally jump ship away from parasitology. Actually, this is an intracellular parasite. It is a bacterium um, and you can see it with fluorescein uh, uh, labeled antibodies uh, within the cells. So these are jam packed full of uh, the infected uh, parasite uh, within the columnar epithelial cells. So I worked on that for a couple of years, and then it was time, let's face it, I got to take a job. Training's over. I need to, to really get my own career uh, underway. And I was recruited back to the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and uh, with a joint appointment at Johns Hopkins Hospital and Johns Hopkins University. And I started that job in 1981. And as I started the job, I go there. I've I've got a uh, you know a chief who's uh, Dr. John Bartlett, uh, who's world renowned in in infectious diseases. And as I arrive, we're seeing young gay men dying of an unknown disease. You know where this story is going to go. Um, the very first report uh, was in a, a, a CDC publication called Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. And it was on June 5th that it was uh, a very rare infection called pneumocystis caused pneumonia and killed uh, five young homosexual men. Uh, just one month later, uh, and we're talking 42 years ago now, um, a very rare cancer started to appear in gay men living in New York City and California. Uh, and you can see now the numbers are starting to grow. So we go from those five men uh, all the way to uh, now 26 uh, gay men. So Dr. Bartlett and I decided we needed to find out what was going on with this as well as many other people uh, because it sounded like an infectious disease. The way it was being spread also smacked of being a sexually transmitted disease. And so the hunt was on to try and find out what the cause was. And um, while we were looking, our hospital beds were starting to fill up with young gay men, somewhere between 25 and 40 years of age, who prematurely aged before our eyes and uh, died a, a terrible death. We had no treatment. And um, it became known under the uh, um, classification as AIDS or acquired immune deficiency syndrome. So for three years, we investigated this disease. It was highly stigmatized. People were outcasts. Uh, people didn't know whether it was infectious to the family or to their friends. Um, and uh, again, CDC, NIAID, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, every investigator in infectious diseases uh, were stumped by this disease for a couple of years. And it's interesting, I just show this again from the CDC MMWR, that from 1982 onward, you can actually see uh, the description of AIDS occurring among Haitians, among hemophiliacs, among people receiving blood transfusions, among infants born to infected mothers, uh, and to female sex partners of men who were bisexually active, all within a one-year period. Well, I was particularly interested in this first report. 
I'm going, how on earth does a disease that's maybe sexually transmitted start occurring in Haitians living in the United States? So uh, I was fortunate enough to pursue this particular line of research. And uh, believe it or not, that's a young uh, Tom Quinn um, sitting in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Uh, this was the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases before Dr. Fauci, who many of you have heard of, before he became the director. So his name's Richard Krause. The two of us went down there and started up an investigation to try and find out, is there AIDS in Port-au-Prince, Haiti? How big of a problem is it? And how is it being transmitted? And how does that relate to the Haitians up in New York and other places being reported with the disease? Well, we went on rounds, and this was a typical ward at the time. There were so many people affected by this disease. It was called Slim's disease or diarrhea wasting syndrome. Um, but it had all the characteristics of AIDS that we saw in the United States. Um, we obtained blood, we looked at their immune system, and lo and behold, they had the same uh, loss of CD4 positive T cells, the hallmark of AIDS. Now, remember, this is 1983, and we still, two years after identification of the disease, we still don't know what's causing it. So as we did our investigation, we actually found out many of these people had worked in a country in Africa called Zaire. It's now called the Democratic Republic of Congo, but uh, individuals who also lived there, who had migrated not back to Haiti, but up to Europe, were also coming down with the disease uh, called AIDS. And so, again, that's that young individual of Tom Quinn, uh, once again with my colleagues, research colleagues, after we arrived in Kinshasa, Zaire. And uh, we started a... Um, very brief investigation, just like we had done in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And we found working in the hospital called Mamiemo Hospital, uh, and here are their wards. Uh, we also worked in the pediatric wards um, that we were able to, um, again, identify this disease called AIDS. Um, and uh, go ahead and put together a report. So our report came out in The Lancet in 1984. This is our epidemiologic investigation. Peter Piot uh, is a Belgian uh, who uh, was actually trained with me uh, in the University of Washington. We became lifelong friends. He ultimately became head or director of UN AIDS, the United Nations agency that oversees AIDS. Um, and we, we described an outbreak of AIDS in a heterosexual population in Zaire. This was the very first report uh, on heterosexual transmission of AIDS, uh, especially from Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, interestingly, for those of you who might pursue an academic career so at some point, uh, we submitted this paper to New England Journal of Medicine, and the rejection letter came back uh, saying, uh, this is a very interesting report, but we, the reviewers, do not believe this disease can be heterosexually transmitted. Uh, and boy, were those reviewers wrong. But uh, when a paper is rejected, it's rejected and you have to go to another journal. We went to Lancet and fortunately, uh, they believed us. Um, on the heels of that, we sent samples to the Pasteur Institute that had just uncovered a retrovirus that seemed to be the cause of AIDS. Now, they called it LAV. Uh, for lymphadenopathy-associated virus. 
but it was later renamed to be HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus. And it was from samples in Europe, the US, and our samples from Africa that pulled all this data together. Um, and on the heels of that, uh, my laboratory developed serologic assays so we could detect HIV. And we formed on the uh, sort of the, again, following our initial investigation, we actually formed a project uh, which was 50-50 in terms of uh, uh, working with our Zairean or Congolese uh, investigators, our European investigators, investigators from CDC and from uh, uh, NIAD. Uh, once again, uh, uh, you can see I'm starting to get a few gray hairs as I'm working through these projects. Uh, but this was called Projet SIDA, that's French for Project AIDS. Um, and we started it in 1984. I won't bore you with all our investigations, but this project probably produced about uh, 200 to 300 publications that initially described the magnitude that this epidemic was causing uh, in uh, Zaire or Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, and I put a paper together for science uh, that was published uh, two years later in 1986, after we knew AIDS was caused by an HIV uh, virus and that we could uh, work very uh, deliberately to define the epidemiology of the disease. Now, I get to this point in my talk because think back to what I had just told you about, how I started out liking tropical medicine, parasitology, epidemiology of sexually transmitted diseases, all that training really led to where I had some expertise to help unravel this new pandemic that was occurring uh, in one country of Africa at the time. And we, we basically, I, I ex expanded this quote uh, from my paper saying the disease is transmitted predominantly by heterosexual activity, parenteral exposure to blood transfusions and unsterilized needles and perinatally from an infected mother to their newborn. And it will continue to spread rapidly. We had no treatment and really no great means, biomedical means, of prevention. Nevertheless, in the conclusion, we say prevention through behavioral means, uh, use of condoms, other types of activities, and control of HIV, it had now been accepted, that was the retrovirus, should be an immediate public health priority for all African countries. I could have said for the whole world, but in 1986, and working in Africa, we really felt this was a serious concern. Well, no one paid attention. It turns out this is an uh, HIV prevalence. I'm sorry the way the uh, terminology is coming out here, uh, but this is 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. And you can see in working in Swaziland uh, over a 10-year uh, period, uh, we monitored prevalence uh, in uh, women attending uh, prenatal clinics. And you can see 40%, 40, or four out of 10 women coming into a clinic pregnant were already infected with HIV. This was a wake-up call that this epidemic, now pandemic, was completely out of control. And once again, there was very little happening to stop it uh, in, in the country, the countries that were affected. I, I went to Uganda and took this one photograph to tell you how uh, desperate this situation was. All of these, and I asked for permission to take this photo, all these people were in a 
clinic, they're all 100% HIV infected. Every single one of these individuals, they're probably long uh, since passed away, waiting for treatment, but there was no treatment. This is in the mid 1990s, um, 10 years after I'd uh, arrived in Kinshasa, now in Kampala, Uganda, looking at this desperate situation. Um, and, and after seeing this, um, biology was expanding very rapidly back uh, in the States. There were some new antiretroviral drugs going through clinical investigations, and they were starting to become available in the US, but not in Africa. I show this one photo of an HIV infected child who passed away about one month after this photograph was taken. Uh, and here is another one, which I took from uh, the New York Times Magazine, actually. Um, these are uh, on, a, uh, children are on the freshly dug grave of their parents. Uh, these two children were HIV negative, but this one uh, is HIV infected and subsequently passed away uh, one year later. So the situation, and this also another photograph just showing the, the wasting syndrome that occurred with this virus. But you can see the desperate need for access to treatment and to better means of prevention. And that leads me to a change in our uh, response uh, to HIV AIDS. And, and that brings me to year 2000. So already uh, essentially 20 years of this pandemic had been going on. Uh, and all the developmental gains of those past three decades were, had been totally reversed. It had a huge economic impact on these uh, African countries. Health system were thrown into pure chaos. Uh, it led to political instability and security concerns. Actually, AIDS was the very first medical uh, issue that uh, turned up in the Security Council of the United Nations because military uh, were being uh, devastated by this disease. It was truly rampant. Um, because of parents dying from the disease, um, it increased the numbers of orphans uh, and, and astounding numbers and led to an immense humanitarian concerns. And the response, uh, starting in the United States and Europe, for people afflicted with this disease was treatment that could increase their life survival. And I show you all these pills because that's essentially one day's dose in year 2000. Today, we've narrowed it down to one single pill a day, and it will increase the survival of an infected person uh, comparable to any other uninfected individual. But this was happening only in the developed world and had not reached the poor countries of the world because this was about $15,000 to $20,000 a year of treatment and no developing country was going to be able to afford that. Well, there was a huge outcry that this was happening, that the rich were getting access to treatment and the poor were being denied. Um, probably the biggest case of inequity in medical care that I have ever witnessed in my career. And so uh, just going back, the United Nations in year 2001, one year after that, declared a commitment 
on HIV AIDS. This uh, follows on the heels of that Security Council um, meeting uh, and uh, UN AIDS, the United Nations AIDS Agency was created. As I mentioned, Peter Piot, my colleague, became the director of it for the next uh, 18 years. Um, and what it did was stimulate funding uh, to the poorer countries, and this is in billions of dollars, to actually help take care of people with HIV AIDS. And there's different agencies and different initiatives that took place. Here's the signing of that declaration that was in 2001. Um, and on the heels of that, the Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria was created. Then the United States under President Bush actually created with bilateral agreement of the uh, entire Congress. We don't see that much anymore, but they all felt something needed to be done from the US to help with this problem in the poor countries. And it's called PEPFAR, President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. And it started out with an annual budget of $5 billion a year. I'll have you know, although this graph only goes to 2010, that here we are in 2023. This is still ongoing. Uh, every year it comes up for appropriations, bilateral agreement of the Congress. The Congress doesn't always uh, agree, disagree 100% of the time. They do agree on certain things. If we could just get them to agree on more things like PEPFAR, uh, the world would be a much happier and safer place. But I, I do want you to know that this one program of the United States uh, is probably the biggest health relief program in the history of our country uh, and is still going on. There are other programs um, and other countries have done bilateral programs, but PEPFAR was launched. We highlighted 13 poor countries. It's now active in like 25 different countries and uh, it has made an enormous uh, uh, benefit, which I'll show you in a minute. So what I do want to show you is the AIDS epidemic, uh, as we know it, as a global health problem. We'll get into what, um, our definitions of global health on the heels of, of the AIDS pandemic. But in uh, 2022, we had a global prevalence of HIV uh, over those 42 years of 84 million people being infected with HIV. Today, about eight, uh, 38 million are living. And so that difference between 38 and 84 are all the deaths that occurred from this pandemic. The sad point is that each year, despite all the treatment we're now getting out there, besides all the biomedical interventions, still 1.5 million people become newly infected each year. And each year, 650,000 people die of AIDS because they did not access treatment. Now, we have a long ways to go, but here's the good news is I'm going to show you that PEPFAR was, remember, launched around 2003. Uh, you remember the UN signing of the declaration was in 2001. And these are the number of people receiving antiretroviral therapy for HIV. So, and this is in the United States. And you can see a fairly level amount, but as money became available, as the drugs became generically produced, it got cheaper and it eventually came down to one pill a day because of the advances in biomedical science. And now with those funds, you can see the number of people being treated uh, annually 
is up to 28 million people. Remember, I mentioned 38 million people are living with HIV. So we still have a gap of 10 million people not getting treatment. That's mostly in poor countries, but it's also in Eastern Europe, sadly, uh, where it's still so heavily stigmatized and the governments just don't want to support it. Um, but as treatment goes up to that 28 million, the number of AIDS deaths actually where it peaked around 2004, this is for the whole world, has actually steadily been declining. People are surviving. Treatment is making a difference. Um, and it's through these efforts of many different countries, many different agencies, community efforts, and so forth, that uh, we have made a difference on this pandemic. Sadly, it's taken us 42 years to get to this point, um, but I'm hopeful that this will continue to decline uh, and the number of people on treatment continues uh, to increase. So what does this all have to do with global health? Um, because this is my journey in, into the realm of global health. And I wanted to show you these two covers uh, because global health didn't really, as a term, didn't really exist prior to 2000. It was always tropical medicine or international health. But with that response to AIDS and the recognition of inequities with AIDS, but it started to expand to tuberculosis, to malaria, to other diseases that the term of global health, because it doesn't matter where you live, that you could acquire the same disease uh, anywhere in the world. Um, none of these infections or chronic diseases recognize political state boundaries. It truly is a global world, and we're focused on the health aspects of the world. And so Science Magazine or Time Magazine started to talk about um, the diseases, and not just infections, but all diseases that were affecting survival rates throughout the world. So let me start with a definition. And this keeps evolving. This definition is like 10 years old. I uh, was part of the team that put this definition together, but we just had a meeting uh, this last spring to, to try and update it. But uh, until we do, this is sort of where we are. Global health's an area of study, research, and practice that places a priority on improving health and achieving equity in health for all people worldwide. You can say equity in health doesn't even exist here in the United States, um, and you'd be right. Um, this is for everywhere. So you can practice global health locally or globally. It doesn't really matter. It is focused on achieving equity in health. So we do emphasize in global health because of that first word, global, that it's transnational health issues. So this crosses all borders. It includes the determinants of uh, uh, poor health and the solutions to improve poor health. It involves many disciplines within and beyond health. And, and I want to emphasize this involves um, business, uh, diagnostics, uh, economy, um, many, uh, you know, uh, engineering, uh, all aspects of uh, discipline can be brought together to address a health problem uh, internationally. And that is global health. Uh, now, a lot of people say, yeah, but aren't you talking about public health? Public health is population-based prevention. Um, and we add in for global health, individual level clinical care. So it's focused on the individual 
as well as the population. And therefore, I say global health embraces public health uh, as a discipline, but brings in medicine and nursing and other uh, aspects. I always like to show some of these uh, covers of, of uh, journals that we all read. And this one was in the Lancet saying, helps them now the most important foreign policy issue of our time. Turns out they followed this issue up with climate change is now the most important foreign policy. It, it, it evolves, obviously. Uh, this is 2006 and now our attention uh, is really on climate change, which I'm gonna get to. Uh, in this talk. But when we talk about health, it's the largest sector of the world economy, accounting for nearly 10% of the global GDP. Uh, it's even bigger in the United States than that. Well, what makes up global health? It, it, you know, I'm an infectious disease person, so my focus is on microbes. Uh, but Cardiologists focus on the heart disease, obesity and nutrition, other issues. Mental health is soon, if not already, the number one cause of chronic morbidity uh, in the world. Accidents, injuries, cancer, diabetes, aging as a whole is an increasing global health problem. Of course, child health and many others. And, and there are lots and lots of readings you can do that do rankings of all these um, particular health problems. Um, but I just summarized that when I put this slide together, the total annual deaths was greater than 57 million people dying prematurely from any of these diseases. And then we, uh, the economists come in and, and they say, can you, you know, put that in dollars? Um, and the way they do it is what's called disability adjusted life years loss. So if you've been disabled by a chronic disease, uh, you've lost years of contributing to uh, the world's economy. And that's been greater than $1.4 billion a, uh, a year. That, uh, that Sorry, daily, uh, globally, because it's disability adjusted life years lost. So what are the determinants of poor health globally? Uh, and these are just a few. Uh, the, the, to go into much more uh, detail would take uh, hours, but this is just a primer to get you started. Uh, well, poverty and social inequality is probably the leading uh, cause of um, uh, global disease. Uh, throughout the world because uh, there's no treatment um, uh, or lack of treatment and other problems. Um, it's also the growth of the world. Um, we've added a billion people to our planet within the last five years, a billion people. Um, and, and you can see this is in Bangladesh, you've got open food markets, you've got poor drinking water, uh, all of these contributing to disease. And if there's one thing that SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 taught us is that if a new virus comes out, say in China or Hong Kong or somewhere, within 24 hours to 48 hours, it's already been transmitted outside of that country. It's very rapid because we travel so uh, commonly, we take it for granted that within 24 hours, I might leave here in Baltimore and I will now be in South Africa down here, literally by, um, by tomorrow. And I will then return a week later and bring whatever I might acquire there back to the United States. I, it is world travel that uh, easily makes a, an infectious agent, a threat to the world. Um, but it's more than infections, as I pointed out. These are the changing climate uh, and, and uh, ecosystems uh, that are posing severe threats uh, to the world. 
Remember I told you I, I pulled the Lancet uh, article again? There's just a couple of years. Climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. Anyone interested in climate change should read uh, some of these. It's pretty impressive. But I, you know, there's a lot of debate uh, about how much is climate change contributing to our health problems of the world and to global health uh, in general. Well, this is from year 1000 up to year 2000, a thousand year uh, curve looking at Northern hemisphere, just the Northern hemisphere um, anomalies. And you can see this was, if you have a standard temperature that uh, was determined in year two, uh, 1990, what were the temperatures like before that and after that? And they give them names. This is a one degree centigrade change uh, that occurred. Uh, this is during the medieval uh, days. I called it the medieval optimum. And you have the little ice age because it was quite cold uh, in the years between 1500 and 1800. Uh, and then started to warm up with the industrial uh, revolution. Let me just amplify that a bit. Again, Northern Hemisphere from 1880 to 2020. And these are measurements since we've started measurements. The previous slide was a lot of ice cores and other types of measurements that were obtained and CO2 uh, concentrations. But these are active measurements uh, from different entities, depending on who you believe the most. Um, and you can see around 1940, 1945 uh, is considered kind of the baseline. Uh, and these are the uh, minus two to minus four degrees centigrade. This is all once again centigrade. Um, but look what's happened since 1980. Um, and we have increased one degree. And I think some of you, I don't know who's from Texas, but if you looked at the temperatures uh, in Texas this past week, they were hitting a 110 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so overall, uh, we are going to see temperature uh, uh, extremes and they will be felt uh, the most dramatic uh, in once again, low and middle income countries, people dying of famine, dying of thirst. We're going to see more and more forest fires. Um, you've seen what's happened in California, now more recently in Canada. Um, and you can see this is a review of 116 papers, confirmed increase of wildfire risk from climate change. Uh, these are the number of acres burned since 1980 to 2020. Uh, yes, you'll get fluctuations but we're seeing more tornadoes, more weather extreme events. I kind of fear the hurricane season um, that may be coming um, since we're already seeing the development of tropical storms. All of this creating um, extreme events that can create injuries, death, they all fall uh, under the aegis of uh, global health. Those rising temperatures, and I know I, I wanted to bring this in because I know you get well-educated about climate change, less so on AIDS, so I'm balancing this. Um, you can see what are the key impacts with these rising temperatures, and it's a color-coded map. Um, and this is actually from The Guardian, as so regular um, uh, articles that, that anyone can obtain that it threatens ecosystems, the weather events, large-scale singular events, coral die-off. Um, the Arctic region is melting. Um, and you can see this is all in comparison to the pre-industrial levels. Um, and, and we're starting to see more and more of these uh, environmental impacts, which are going to cause more uh, health-related issues. Another thing climate change influences, as well as the travel, as well as the crowding, all of those determinants of health is 
emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. I went into infectious diseases literally in 1977. Um, this is really a map of what new epidemics have occurred during my academic uh, or clinical practice. All of these uh, uh, posing major uh, health threats to people around the world. So I'm gonna close on um, something that you've all witnessed. And now we can talk about HIV, uh, but uh, SARS-CoV-2 or a new coronavirus uh, was first alerted in December 31. Uh, and by January 21, cases were being reported already in the US, uh, Hong Kong, Europe, other places. So one month uh, to actually seeing all these uh, changes. And fast forward all the way to uh, la end of last month, this is the daily, daily new confirmed deaths due to COVID-19 in the United States. What's shown here in these epidemic curves, this is the Wuhan virus, then it became the subtype called alpha then Delta occurred, and then Omicron occurred. Uh, and with vaccination occurring back in early 2021, fatalities have started to come down, but infection has still uh, persisted. And so you can see globally, there's been uh, 768 million cases uh, of, uh, of this disease and six uh, all, all, essentially 7 uh, uh, million deaths. Um, and you can see in the U.S., 103 uh, um, million cases and over 1 million fatalities. You know, sitting there and you're wondering about a, a coronavirus, just in one day, 208 people in late May died of coronavirus, of uh, COVID. You know, we think it's gone away. It hasn't. Not if 200 people are dying from it still on a daily basis in our own country. Well, biomedical science will always try to keep up by 20, end of 2020. The, the big uh, biomedical advance was on vaccines. Now, vaccines became very controversial because there was a lot of anti-science uh, sentiment and uh, was this too fast for these vaccines uh, to be developed and to, to be deployed uh, to the world? And it also smacked of inequities that the United States, Canada, uh, Europe, they all got the vaccine first. But what about Africa? They had to wait six to nine months before they could access uh, any of these vaccines. So once again, global health is trying to make a difference on those inequities. So I'll end with our latest epidemic. It's not gone away either. It's called MPOX, but you might know it as monkeypox. No longer called that. It's called MPOX because this is a human disease now. Um, you can see it uh, in one year, 87,000 people became infected with this. Again, mostly sexually transmitted. Uh, in the U.S., we had our epidemic uh, in starting along in May of 2022, peaked uh, in, during the summer months, and because of public health uh, uh, efforts, it has since subsided. Are there still cases? The answer is yes. Well, I've taken up an hour of your time. It's exactly one o'clock Eastern time. Um, I apologize for going a little bit over, uh, but uh, if you uh, enjoyed this and are interested in global health, uh, we have a newsletter, a website uh, called uh, www.johnshopkinsglobalhealth.org. Uh, 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 feel free to check out the website, sign up for our newsletter, uh, and keep abreast of uh, the things that are going on. And thank you all for listening. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to CM at this point.
Thanks. Well, thank you, Dr. Quinn, for the really excellent presentation uh, and for taking the time to open our conference for us. We uh, really learned a lot. Uh, and I was wondering, do you happen to have a few minutes, Dr. Quinn, to take any questions from the uh, students? I absolutely do. I'm okay, glad so to. I, I went a little bit over. I, I, I will stay a little bit over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So um, if you'd like, Dr. Quinn, I believe students, will, uh, if uh, you have a question, if you could please raise your hand using the Zoom function. Um, and then, Dr. Quinn, would you just like to call on any students? And then, of course, we want to be respectful of your time. Uh, so we'll try and get to as many questions as we can. Um, but please do raise your hand if you have a question. All right. So a lot of hands are going up. I'm going to try and be brief to your questions as best so we can get through a, a bunch. Tate, you're first up in my uh, screen. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I'm Kate. I'm from Colorado. Um, and I remember your talk from last year and this year, I mean, which is as uh, great as I remember it. Uh, but I have, I have a lot of questions. So I'll just start with one. Um, I was really interested in that first uh, kind of project you talked about, about uh, genetically engineering mosquitoes. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard a lot about like the ethical and moral dilemmas. And I was just wondering what you think about that. Like, do you think that uh, genetically modifying mosquitoes will have uh, worse impacts on ecosystems in the future or worse impacts on humans? I guess, like, what do you think about that? Well, I think, uh, you know, from a global health perspective, again, we're trying to generate and improved health. There could be some e ecosystem changes, but mosquitoes primarily are uh, a, a, a pest uh, uh, that do spread disease. I um, Yes, they provide, you know, in the animal kingdom, their food for birds and other types of things. But um, I do believe that uh, to decrease malaria, decrease dengue, which is epidemic right now in Peru um, and is being spread by mosquitoes, yellow fever, which is epidemic in Ghana and other parts of Africa. We, we really need to try our best. I actually think genetically engineering mosquitoes to uh, not spread disease um, uh, is, is better than suffering all those uh, particular uh, disease and are better than insecticides, which harm much more uh, elements of the animal kingdom. Uh, let me move on, Andre, you're next. Hello, I'm, oh uh, yeah, thank you. So I'm Andre and from Kentucky. I'd really like to thank you for your awe-inspiring uh, presentation. I'd like to ask with the decades of experience that you've had and all the experiences that you had, um, what, what advice would you give to a high school student thinking of pursuing a career in global health? Uh, get involved. Uh, you can do that locally um, uh, as to uh, helping out with, um, you know, clinics or uh, seeing how uh, your community, because uh, it's hard for you to go overseas at this point. Um, so from a high school perspective, it's getting involved uh, in your science courses and education along those lines. But I would say uh, community uh, volunteerism is the first step uh, in getting in engaged. And there are a lot of uh, groups that uh, would welcome your volunteerism to, to that. Uh, well, thank Kashi. you so much. Yeah, Kashi, uh, you're next. Hi, I'm Kashi, I'm from New Jersey. and. You talked a lot about how you visited so many different low-income communities and countries throughout your research in all those years. And I just wanted to know how you were able to deal with seeing such tragedies on a daily basis and countries you visited and not letting it impact your research or not letting it impact your work and how you were so determined for all of it. Well, if, if anything, it increased my determination. Um, I would say the biggest impact for me when I went to Port-au-Prince, Haiti, I saw the poverty that I had not witnessed growing up and going to privileged schools and so forth. Uh, so it, it, it uh, enhanced my realism of what this world is like. Uh, when I went to Africa uh, and saw the disease states there and that no one was taking care of them and it was the stigma was even worse. Um, it, it gave me a greater determination to come back, work with the biomedical people, try and advocate for cheaper drugs, access to drugs and medications. 
So um, going through those experiences equals increased determination for me. It, it, it emphasized the realism of how so much inequity exists in the world. And you don't need to leave your community. Back to the other question. There's inequities in your own community. Start there as high school students and then move onward as you can. For those that are in college, going to college, there are opportunities to actually uh, do get engaged uh, overseas. And so check with your universities when you do go there uh, as to what you could do. All right, Prana, Pranavi, uh, you're next. Hi, Dr. Quinn. Again, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. So I was just curious, since you were involved in um, studying HIV and AIDS at the time, what was the process like in coming up with or searching for a treatment, especially when the technology wasn't as advanced as today? It's interesting. Um, yeah, there, when we saw so many people dying uh, and we then discovered what the virus was, um, there was a huge response of both the pharmaceutical companies as well as the academics to come up with uh, a way of beating this virus. Now, we can't cure HIV. We're still working on that. 40 years later, we're still trying to come up with a way of curing someone. We can cure hepatitis C. Um, so, so you know, it's there's always a biomedical evolution that coincides with the appearance of an epidemic. The pharmaceutical companies are doing it um, and hope, you know, they've got good scientists there that mean well. The companies have stockholders and they're trying to make a, a buck out of it as well. And, and so there's different forces that go uh, uh, on and you only need to look at the vaccine. You know, the first vaccine for coronavirus, uh, COVID, um, really came out of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. It was government funded, but simultaneously Pfizer uh, was working on uh, trying to come up with a vaccine. And they have a lot of animal vaccines, not a lot of human vaccines, it turns out. But they had the technologies that um, once the scientists at NIH came up with the basic concept, they had to give it to Big Pharma to really launch it because that's where the big bucks are and to get it moving. Um, but then that posed a problem for... Uh, access to expensive vaccines in the poor countries. So you've, you've got a lot of elements always at flux. But I would say we all worked pretty well together to come up with a vaccine uh, uh, to, to stop the fatalities. The vaccine doesn't stop transmission. I, it's, I'll be the first to say that. But it is good in modifying uh, fatalities. And that's key. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Uh, e. Croup, you you're next. Hi, um, I'm E. Croup. I'm from California. I found your um, AIDS research really interesting. So um, the question I had was that how has like the response to certain outbreaks evolved over time since the time of the AIDS outbreak to now where we just had a pandemic? And what impact has it had on shaping health policies on a global scale? Um, that, that's a great question. How has it shaped uh, global health policy? Uh, AIDS has been sort of a driver uh, because of the stigma, uh, because of the fatalities, the decreasing survival across the world. Um, and then with treatment, and we've taken treatment and we now use that in prevention, um, that it has impacted uh, public health policy uh, in just about every country with some exceptions. I'm gonna single out one. Uh, I could get into trouble doing this, but uh, one country that sort of ignores the problem, uh, hasn't changed their policy is Russia. Um, I went to Russia when it was the USSR and I can tell you uh, the people there when I went in the 80s, 
uh, really wanted to put a stop to the spread of it. I've not witnessed that same kind of change. So it's, you know, there's global policy by WHO, by UNAIDS, things like that, the United Nations, but there's also domestic national policies. Um, and you need leadership to support the national policies. And you could critique the U.S. in some ways. We were very slow to respond in the 80s, very slow as a nation. Uh, even after when we knew what the virus was, we were very slow. It wasn't really until the 2000s that we started to really get our, our, our act together. Uh, to respond. But there are Eastern European countries besides Russia that uh, have been slow to respond. Also, slow to respond in some of the Asian countries as well. So I hope that helps answer your response. Lena? Hi, um, my name is Lena from Tennessee. Thank you for taking the time to give this amazing presentation. Personally, I have a family that live in um, Ethiopia. So I've seen how like poor infrastructure and health has really impacted them and their health. So I was wondering what like, do you think are some important next steps or like action items that you think big um, health organizations should take when it comes to increasing awareness and like treatment access and education in like other countries, whether that be like, um, less developed countries or even like in America in general, because sometimes some countries may not take as quick of an action um, needed, such as like what, what happened with like HIV and like AIDS research. Yeah, so getting people like yourself into the World Health Organization or the United Nations, and they do have students that come in periodically under certain programs working within your own community that's that you always can start with that but aim bigger try to see if you can access you know they have these model congress sessions for students uh and so forth uh it, i think having people like you with your interest and your experience having uh come from ethiopia uh would be great um the, the one word i'll use um to that, that needs to happen is advocacy. Uh, it's advocacy at the local level and at the global level. And uh, we all need to be a part of that advocacy uh, as best we can. Um, and, and that's, you know, as an individual, you can make a difference. Everyone says that. Uh, and where you make a difference is in the advocacy and being a voice. Look at that one I think she was a high school student, the woman from uh, from Sweden who wanted to bring awareness to climate change. Uh, and she did. She, in fact, went to the United Nations and she spoke there and um, really was a, a major voice. So uh, you do it with what you're comfortable with, start in the community and then move, move uh, forward. You're young. There's lots of years ahead of you, so uh, go to it. Uh, I wish you all the best. Julia, question? Yeah, so um, it's been such an amazing opportunity to hear from you and all of your innovations in the global health field. Um, so you mentioned like stigmas and like in terms of Europe and how that affected AIDS. And then they're still present today, like with drug addiction. And I was wondering how much you think like stigmas are an obstacle and how we can overcome it. Oh, stigma is a major problem. Um, education is the only way you really get over stigma. Um, uh, because, uh, you know, back un until we were all well educated as to some of these health problems, um, there it was just terrible um, uh, how people were treated, mistreated. Uh, and uh, denied access to, to really good care. Uh, but as uh, more and more people became educated and became transformed uh, as to what needed to happen to change this, uh, things really evolved. Politics enters into this, and I don't want this to be a political talk, but when you talk about injecting drug use, there are some states 
that do not believe or support needle exchange programs. Um, needle exchange programs have been proven to decrease the spread of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, hepatitis um, um, and uh, HIV and other types of diseases. So some states are more proactive, some less so. Whether that's a political belief uh, or it's stigma or lack of education, I, I can't answer that. Uh, those of you within your own states can probably make your own determinations on, on how um, needle exchange programs work or do not work. Uh, they're not allowed in those Eastern African countries that I was talking about. Part of that due to stigma. Who uses needles? Well, there are the people who um, have been disadvantaged along in their life, might have mental illness, become addicted to drugs because they were on um, uh, oral narcotics, whatever it may be. Um, and the threat of disease is always there. So um, uh, it's it, it's a problem. Uh, stigmas, I, the only way I can see a way around it is through educating the political leaders and uh, other people in the communities. Hope that helps. It's, it's a big problem. Yeah, at thank all. you so much. Yeah, at all. Oh, hi, I'm Atul. I'm from Michigan. Uh, once again, thank you for your presentation and all the work that you've done in um, global health. Uh, I was wondering if there was like one success and one shortcoming you could list from like the um, HIV AIDS epidemic and like how like um, leaders today that fight infectious disease outbreaks can like learn from them. Uh, say that again. I, I got a little distracted for a second. Uh, and, and say that again and uh, make a list. <laughs> so uh, if you had like one um, success and one shortcoming from like the yeah. HIV AIDS response that can be applied by global health leaders to infectious outbreaks today. Mm. Uh, the, the success was um, getting access to, to medication uh, around the world, making it universal. So that's its success. The shortcoming is probably from part of the previous question. It's stigma. It's a lack of political leadership to mount a, an effective control program. Um, and every country uh, was involved in that. I showed you the African context in the, in the 90s. We knew it was going to expand, but political leaders ignored it. Um, and and so I I would say uh, that um, shortcoming uh, still exists. Uh, and if I had my way, it would be to pull together those political leaders, show them what's been effective, convince them that they can do the same in their own country, and move that forward. Thank you, Sierra. You're next. And then I'm probably, I know a lot of you have your hands up, but um, 20 minutes over. So uh, I'll probably take this question and maybe the next one, and then I'm going to have to say goodbye. I hope that's okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Sierra Shaw. I'm rising 11th grade. Um, and thank you for your presentation. Um, so my question is, what are the major implications? So you talked about dengue virus, and I know yeah. that's also in, um, you know, South America and South Asia. So I'm wondering, like, what are like the major implications of dengue on global health and its burden on the healthcare system, economic impact, and the potential strategies to mitigate the disease's effect on a global scale? Yeah, so... You know, that is mosquito transmitted, and we talked about that before, and uh, they are using insecticides massively to try and limit uh, the spread of the mosquito, the spread of the disease by mosquitoes. What's its impact on global health? Well, it turns out if those people with dengue fly to areas where Aedes aegypti, the mosquito, exists, they, they have the potential to spread that disease to other people. Um, and uh, we certainly 
Southeast Asia and uh, Peru, South America, really having a terrible time with it right now. Uh, this is new. Uh, it's been, they believe, due to climate change uh, and an increase in the vector population. Um, so every effort into engineering, diagnostics, treatment needs to be taken uh, uh, into uh, concert at this point. So, okay. yeah, so, Kat, watch the news on that. <laughs> and uh, on that, so you said about insecticide to continue, like they're trying to use that to kind of remove mosquitoes, but wouldn't that also have a like a like climate change impact? Yeah, no, I don't like insecticides. Um, so I think they have environmental impact. Um, that's why I, I believe more in the genetic engineering course. That's what I worked on when I was in, in outside of college. Um, so I, uh, I'm concerned about misuse of the insecticides. They're better. They're not DDT anymore. So uh, their ramifications to other wildlife and other things is, is less than it was in the 50s and 60s when I was growing up and they used DDT. Um, so it is, it is a problem. Um, I think early diagnosis and, and, you know, treatment of symptomatic, uh, cases, uh, is, is just as important at this point. Thanks. Thanks. Nidish, uh, last question. I, I'm sorry to everyone else who has their hands up. I feel bad, but, um, you all need to get going probably. Nidish? Hi, Dr. Quinn. Hi, um, okay. thank you. Uh, my name is Nitish and I'm from Arizona. Um, so, you know, we've been talking a lot about the intersection between global health and politics. So I was wondering, you know, is there any recognition for the threat that increasing governmental polarization plays in go um, global health? Um, if I understand your question right, the politiliz politization of global health comes down to money. So um, uh, certain politics uh, will say we shouldn't be spending money taking care of people in other areas of the world, uh, or certain monies shouldn't be going to the research to try and come up with, say, a malaria vaccine, because we don't have malaria. Why are we putting all that money into it? Uh, and yet other politics say, no, um, global health uh, is also good health, uh, is also good foreign policy. Um, and we do need to be doing that. So the polarization of our politics directly impacts the amount of funding that can go towards um, global health endeavors. So I'll say that on one point. Another is, you know about this interaction. Uh, this is again political right now um, with um, whether the um, NIH, uh, which I'm part of, should be funding different um, areas of the world in, in terms of grants and contracts. And why shouldn't that money all remain in the US? But I'll tell you, I wouldn't have learned what I did uh, in Haiti, in Africa, uh, in Asia, and, and so forth, unless there had been funding to help support me to go to those activities. And I would say, uh, if I hadn't gone, maybe others would have made it, but they would have been dependent on funding. So. Politics and funding are go hand in hand uh, because that's that's who uh, generates that. We have uh, U.S. aid. We have global health funding uh, that comes from uh, the U.S. Congress, and there's those that really embrace it, and others that are going to say no, only U.S. centric. So, what can I say about that? Is advocacy. Uh, and uh, you have your own access to your own state representatives, your state politicians, 
um, senators and, and governor and house of representatives, you know, um, keeping in touch with what is going on within your own state and community um, uh, is very important. And I really encourage you to do that. Mm.